Tonight, the Dow plummets as the financial world is rocked by the fate of two powerhouse investment firms, including the biggest bankruptcy in U.S. history. What will it all mean to the economy and to you? I'm Kitty Couric. Also tonight, the financial crisis is suddenly topic A on the campaign trail. John McCain blasts greed and corruption on Wall Street, while Barack Obama says Senator McCain would bring more of the same. What Ike left behind. No lights, no gas, no water, and nowhere to go. The governor of Texas tells evacuees, stay where you are. And the L.A. train crash. The engineer sped through a stop signal. Was he text messaging at the time? This is the CBS Evening News with Katie Couric. Good evening, everyone. The subprime mortgage mess has left millions of Americans struggling to stay in their homes. And tonight, Wall Street is feeling their pain. The Dow fell by 4.4% today, more than 500 points, the worst one-day point drop since 9-11. It came after Wall Street giant Lehman Brothers filed for Chapter 11 protection, by far the largest U.S. bankruptcy ever. Merrill Lynch was, meanwhile, swallowed up by Bank of America in the biggest buyout of a brokerage house in history. And the nation's largest insurance company, AIG, scrambled for new loans to stay afloat. Anthony Mason now looks at a day that left Wall Street reeling. This is going to be one of the watershed days in financial markets history. It was a manic Monday in the financial markets. The Dow tumbled more than 500 points after two pillars of the street tumbled over the weekend. Lehman Brothers, a 158-year-old firm, filed for bankruptcy. I don't think anyone really expected a bank as big as Lehman to uh, you know, be in a position that it's in now. Brought down by bad mortgage investments, Lehman, which has 25,000 employees, will be liquidated. I'm starting to find another job. Meanwhile, Merrill Lynch, fearing it could be next, agreed in an act of desperation to a shotgun marriage with Bank of America. Merrill, the country's biggest brokerage with 60,000 employees, had been battered by nearly $50 billion in mortgage-related losses. It is definitely a very, very difficult time, and it's not going to get better quickly. So in just six months, three of the five biggest independent firms on Wall Street have now disappeared. Bear Stearns, which collapsed last spring, Lehman Brothers, and Merrill Lynch. Treasury Secretary Henry Paulson tried to reassure investors today. The American people can remain confident in the soundness and the resilience of our financial system. Paulson attempted to broker a deal to sell Lehman over the weekend, but unlike the buyout deal for Bear Stearns, the government would not offer any financial guarantees. I never once considered that it was appropriate to put taxpayer money on the line with, 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 uh, in resolving Lehman Brothers. It would have required an $85 billion subsidy to keep afloat. Overall, I estimate it's going to cost at least $400 billion if you wanted to bail out the whole bunch. They're certainly not worth it. It's better to let them fail. Insurance giant AIG is the next name on the list of troubled companies. It's looking for $40 billion in bridge loans. Some people say this, this doesn't stop until the housing, housing hits bottom. You think that's true? I, I think that's probably correct. Veteran trader Art Cashin believes there could be more casualties. This is the, the fifth time we've seen this movie. And you sit on the edge of your seat and you yell at whichever character it is, don't go into that woodshed, but they keep going in. <laughs> the Federal Reserve meets tomorrow. The expectation before the events of this past weekend was that the Fed would sit tight on interest rates. But now some are actually forecasting another Fed rate cut tomorrow. Katie? And Anthony, I know individual investors don't have their money in Lehman Brothers. It's those big corporate institutions that are most directly impacted by the bankruptcy. So what will happen to the assets that are left? Yeah, Lehman, Katie, actually has $600 billion worth of assets. Some of those profitable ones, and there are some, will get sold up the, off. The others will get divided up in bankruptcy court, and that could take years. It's important to note here, Katie, that one reason the Fed and the Treasury did not inject government money in a deal to try to save Lehman was that they thought many of their clients had time to anticipate all this. Katie? All right. Anthony Mason on Wall Street. Anthony, thank you. From corporate America trying to weather the storm to middle-class Americans worrying about their nest eggs, this latest financial crisis has a lot of people asking a lot of questions. Jeff Glor talked to some experts, and tonight he has some answers.
Wall Street's woes have Main Street wondering what happened. How do institutions so old and once so respected fall so dramatically and suddenly? You know, I have one word for you. Greed. Regulators, congressmen, CEOs, investors, borrowers, lenders, we all got too greedy. We went to that frat party, we partied our butts off, and now we're paying the price, and this is a big hangover. In other words, financial advisor Jill Schlesinger says too many loans were given and too many loans were taken. Everyone thought home prices would rise forever. They didn't, leaving the worst housing crisis since the Great Depression, a battered market, and as Smart Money Magazine writer Russell Perlman has seen, plenty of fear. A lot of people scared right now, mm -hmm. saying, should I pull the money out of my 401k right. or other investments? Your answer to that is what? The biggest thing, don't panic. As bad as things look today, they're just going to be a blip on the market radar 10, 20 years from now. Is it worth it all suspending the paycheck deductions? Absolutely and saying, not. Absolutely. I'm, gonna, I'm sorry to cut you off, but you know what? Hey. Absolutely not. This is the time where you you should be putting more money in it. Schlesinger says, think about it this way. You get something on sale, a 20% discount from where the market was last year. But what if you need money today? How tough is it to get a loan right now, especially if you want to buy a home? It's extremely tough right now. The good news is crunches like this don't last forever. So if you can afford to wait, on getting any sort of loan, whether it's a car loan or a home loan, wait, because odds are in a few months it will be easier and most likely cheaper to get that type of loan. Another big question is when will all of this be over? There's a growing consensus on Wall Street today that this past weekend may have been the worst of it. That said, Katie, it will likely still be well into next year before the economy's fully back on track. Katie. Jeff Glor, Jeff, thanks very much. And one more down business note. Hewlett Packard said today it plans to cut nearly 25,000 jobs, 7.5% of its workforce. Most of the job cuts will be within electronic data systems, which HP recently bought. Now, no surprise that today's dramatic financial news was the headline out on the campaign trail. Both presidential contenders outlined how they would deal with the problem. Despite Wall Street woes, John McCain said that the fundamentals of the economy are strong, and that prompted Barack Obama to mock him as out of touch. We have two reports on the candidates and their reactions. First, here's Dean Reynolds. Colorado, we can't afford that kind of future. In Colorado, a combative Barack Obama pounced on the worrisome news from Wall Street as Exhibit A in his argument for change. Too many folks in Washington and on Wall Street weren't minding the store. In new, more confrontational remarks, Obama tried to yoke John McCain to an economic philosophy that he says has brought America to the brink. Now, instead of prosperity trickling down, the pain has trickled up. And he followed that up by questioning McCain's grasp of the nation's number one issue. This morning, he said that the fundamentals of the economy are still strong. <laughs> Senator McCain, what economy are you talking about? The speech featured a long indictment of past McCain positions, including opposition to increases in Social Security and the minimum wage. And it accused him of being a captive of special interests and whose claims to be a change agent are laughable. And if you think those lobbyists are working day and night for John McCain just to put themselves out of business, well, I've got a uh, bridge to sell you up in Alaska. For weeks, fellow Democrats have been urging him to fight back harder against Republican attacks. Now, after watching his poll numbers gradually decline, Barack Obama seems to be taking their advice. Dean Reynolds, CBS News, Grand Junction, Colorado. I'm Nancy Cordes. Senator John McCain wasted no time putting some distance between himself and President Bush in the wake of today's financial news. And we'll put an end, as I said, to running Wall Street like a casino. Stumping in Florida, McCain explained why he considers the economy fundamentally sound. Our workers have been the strength of our economy, and they remain the strength of our economy today. Across the country, in Golden, Colorado, his running mate laid out for the first time the issues she would tackle as vice president. My mission is going to be energy, security, and government reform. Again today, Governor Palin repeated her boast that she shot down a now infamous Alaska project. 
And that infamous bridge to nowhere, I did tell Congress, thanks, but no thanks. If we wanted a bridge up there, we were going to build it ourselves. That claim was debunked in a CBS News reality check. In fact, the state kept the cash. In fact, they have $73 million in earmarked money to help them complete the project. Palin continues to draw large and curious crowds at rallies. But when she's not on stage, she has kept as far as possible from the public eye. Palin has yet to hold a news conference and steers well clear of the national reporters who travel with her everywhere. It is a rare thing to have a keynote go this long with zero interaction on the record with reporters outside of one interview. But as long as Palin keeps packing venues, the campaign sees little reason to trot her out before a more critical crowd. Nancy Cordes, CBS News, Golden, Colorado. And more fallout from the latest economic news. The price of oil is dropping like a rock amid concern that the economy is slowing. Today, crude fell more than $5 a barrel to close below 100 for the first time since March. But as oil falls, gas prices have risen by 19 cents in the past week to 384 a gallon as Gulf refineries remain closed because of Hurricane Ike. Now, Ike may be gone, but it left a trail of misery from the Gulf Coast to the Midwest. Tonight, at least 34 deaths are blamed on the powerful storm. More than 3.8 million people remain without power. And tomorrow, President Bush will visit hard-hit Texas, where at least 37,000 people have been displaced. Mark Strassman is in Galveston tonight. Mark, rescue teams have their work cut out for them, don't they? They sure do, Katie. In fact, the top priority here in Ike's aftermath is still search and rescue. And so in Galveston here, for instance, today, teams went house to house, building to building in battered neighborhoods. They were so relieved. Elderly and disabled residents surviving for three days in Galveston without power or water. Finally, they were leaving for San Antonio. But B. Devaney was losing it. On the second floor, her husband Brian in his wheelchair was stuck. I'm scared. I'm, that's why I'm shaking. I'm just, I've been crying all night, just panicked about what I can do to help him. I, I feel helpless. Elevators weren't running, so the Devaney's fretted. But getting downstairs is the hard part. Yeah, it's going to be tough. Wherever Ike smashed Texas for hundreds of miles, the essentials, power, water, gasoline, and patience are all in short supply. In Houston, victims lined up for food. Many people here will have to do without power for weeks. If I was prepared for this, yes. Yeah, we all were. Not, not for months. In most hard-hit areas, victims were told to stay away. But in LaPorte, Texas, some people returned to a shock. This is my first time back, and we just saw our house, and it's pretty devastating. But there's another gathering storm of frustration from people kept away from unsafe neighborhoods. We got to start cleaning up now. If we don't, we'll wind up like New Orleans, gone forever. Live, live. Brian Devaney got out on a canvas litter and the brawn of 10 men. Thank you so much. Everybody. Right, take God care. For another week, the main bridge to this island may stay closed. Residents told to stay away. The last thing Galveston needs is more hungry, thirsty people. Katie? Mark Strassman. Mark, thank you very much. There is more CBS News ahead. Each candidate claims the other will raise your taxes. Coming up later, we'll have a reality check. But up next, LA's deadly train crash and a terrifying theory. Was the engineer distracted by his cell phone?
Two teenagers may hold the key to what caused Friday's deadly train crash outside Los Angeles. 25 people were killed and more than 130 hurt in the worst train accident in this country in 15 years. Tonight, federal investigators are looking into the teenagers claim that the engineer of a commuter train sent them a text message moments before it slammed into a freight train. More now from Ben Tracy. Commuters in Los Angeles this morning weren't just stressed about going to work. It was about simply getting there. I, I had a friend that died on Friday. She lost her life when a Metrolink commuter train collided with a freight train just outside of Los Angeles, leaving a tangled mess of metal that trapped commuters in the wreckage for hours. Among those who died was Gabby Magdaleno's sister, Aida. I loved her so much. Still love her. She's going to be in my heart forever. The question now is why the Metrolink train's engineer, seen in this blurry video and killed in the crash, seems to have ignored a red signal on the track. He may have been distracted by text messages he was apparently exchanging with teenage train enthusiasts just before the crash. We must acknowledge that it was a Metrolink engineer that made the error that caused yesterday's accident. Metrolink spokeswoman who made that surprising admission over the weekend abruptly resigned today. Federal investigators now say it's too early to tell exactly what went wrong. This is really tragic, particularly tragic because it was so preventable. For decades, the NTSB has asked for collision warning systems on trains. Here's how they work. Transponders in the tracks monitor location and speed of moving trains. If two trains are coming at each other on the same track, the system automatically shuts them down, avoiding a head-on collision. But in the lower 48 states, the technology exists on just 240 miles of track, mostly in the Northeast Corridor. Here in Southern California, where commuter and freight trains share more track than anywhere else in the country, there is no warning system. Why? It would cost billions of dollars to install, and some in the rail industry feel it's unreliable. For those who lost loved ones in the crash, the lack of warning is the hardest thing to bear. Ben Tracy, CBS News, Los Angeles. Two health news and serious questions about some new antipsychotic drugs used to treat schizophrenia in children and teenagers. Risperdal and Zyprexa were thought to be more effective and safer than older drugs, but a study out today by the National Institute of Mental Health found they're no better than older drugs and can also cause side effects, including significant weight gain. Coming up next, time to hold the candidates accountable for what they're saying on the trail.
While the presidential candidates spent today interpreting what happened on Wall Street, many voters want to know what the plans are when it comes to their taxes. Each candidate says his opponent will raise them. Wyatt Andrews now has this reality check. It's one of the most explosive political charges of the election. John McCain wants to tax your health care benefits. Obama's claim that John McCain wants to tax the health insurance benefits Americans buy through their employers. That's a $3.6 trillion tax increase potentially on middle class families. And that would eventually leave tens of millions of you paying higher taxes. John McCain wants a multi-trillion dollar tax on the middle class. Here are the facts. Obama has the tax part correct, but the impact on the middle class is exaggerated. Most people will see tax cuts. McCain does want to tax the health insurance benefits that 60 million Americans now buy through their employers tax-free. However, McCain also proposes to give the money back as a tax credit, $2,500 for individuals, $5,000 for families. Let's give them a $5,000 refundable tax credit to go out and get the health insurance of their choice. It's mostly a tax break. The nonpartisan Tax Policy Center says McCain's idea starts out helping the middle class. Families that at all income levels would pay lower taxes, at least on average. The, on, on average, it's about a $1,200 tax cut in 2009. On the issue of energy, meanwhile, Governor Palin is touting her energy expertise based on Alaska's production. My job has been to oversee nearly 20 percent of the U.S. domestic supply of oil and gas. Here are the facts. According to the Energy Department, Palin's numbers are high. Alaska provides 14.3 percent of America's crude oil and only 2.6 percent of its natural gas. On the health care debate, the Obama campaign tells CBS News that one day the middle class will be hit by a McCain tax increase, but the experts we consulted said that day is 10 years away. Wyatt Andrews, CBS News, Washington. And we'll be back in a moment with this week's political calendar. Tomorrow, can't pry your kids away from video games? You'll be surprised to find out why you should let them keep on playing. Our exclusive series begins tomorrow on the CBS Evening News with Katie Curran.
As we mentioned earlier, today's sobering economic news took center stage on the campaign trail. Now it's unclear how or if it will affect the candidate's schedules, but for now, here's what's coming up on the CBS News Campaign 08 calendar. Tomorrow, Barack Obama attends a Hollywood fundraiser hosted by the DreamWorks team. Steven Spielberg, David Geffen, and Jeffrey Katzenberg, Barbara Streisand will perform. John McCain and Sarah Palin will be back together at an afternoon rally in Vienna, Ohio. On Wednesday, Senator Obama campaigns in Nevada, while running mate Joe Biden will focus on the economy as he kicks off a bus tour through the critical swing state of Ohio. Senator McCain and Governor Palin will campaign in another swing state, Michigan. The next day, they'll head to Iowa. And looking ahead a week from this Friday, the first presidential debate will be held in Oxford, Mississippi. Meanwhile, on our calendar tomorrow, the next in our series of Where They Stand reports, the candidates' plans for fixing the housing and mortgage crises. But that's all the time we have for tonight, and that is the CBS Evening News. I'm Katie Couric. Thank you for watching. Good night.